welcome to church and <clears throat> rushing. It's been a, I felt to pray that way because that's what the devil thought he'd won on Good Friday. Even the disciples maybe thought he'd won. The way they acted, but God's got other plans. I tell you what, today I don't think I've been to, uh, in all my years of running a service, have I had so many things go wrong before the service started. We lost three band members and a sound man. Wow. Sound man was five minutes before. <laughs> and so Blake, who doesn't normally do sound, has taken control, handed off his team that he's running today. Uh, we have the um, grandmother of one of our candidates, fell over last night, broke her arm and her finger and and uh, you know, the enemy does not want something to happen supernatural today. And guess what? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Because we actually have a very different kind of baptism today. There's going to be a few things that are going to be quite different this morning. And, but before that, we're going to just preach the word and, um, for a few minutes. And uh, if I can do it in a few minutes. I, I, I had a great record on Friday. And, um, but I can't promise that today. So... Um, and uh, especially when I haven't got my sermon open. But hey, well, so welcome to church on Easter Sunday. Happy Easter Sunday. I don't know if you meant to say that, but it is a happy day. Uh, every day should be a happy day. It's the day the Lord has made. And uh, uh, if you are a guest here, our landing up top, we have, we have tables up there. So you can have a free cup of coffee and, uh, this morning. And um, uh, so we'd love you to come and join us at the end of the service. And don't rush off. And we'd love to get to meet you and uh, get to know you. And for everybody else this morning, um, no, thank you. <laughs> and sorry, Lawrence. And uh, uh, so we, this morning I want to read a scripture to you on Easter Sunday. Luke 24, 1 to 12. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. He isn't in the ground. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And then they remembered that he had said this. I find that the most interesting passage, that you would forget that. And then it happens, and you still forget it until someone points it out to you. But they're human like we are. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. Gee, that's so typical. So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up. He ran to the tomb to look, stooping. He peered in, didn't go in, and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Wondering what had happened. Wondering what had happened. He lives. Jesus is alive. You know, Sir, Sir Lionel Luck, who, the world's most successful trial lawyer, according to the Guinness Book of Records, examined the evidence for Christ's resurrection and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Christ did die. We talked a little bit about it Friday. Hundreds testified to seeing it. He wasn't in a coma because the flogging that would normally happen in those days was usually fatal. Crucifixion was always fatal. So he had to die. A surviving crippled Christ would have been very uninspiring to his disciples. You wouldn't die later on for such a person as a crippled survivor. His resurrection was not a myth, however. An ancient resurrection story would not be fabricated on the basis of women's testimonies. And in those days, and I don't mean that derogatory now, but in those days, women were not allowed to testify in court. Their word was not reputable to the men of that time. And we even see it in the account that the women gave when they came back to say he was alive. And so we, God would not pick that out of any common sense, except for that he's alive. Jesus' opponents, by their actions, admitted that the tomb was empty. They tried to make a story up that it was empty. No reasonable motive was there to take a body. 515 witnesses attest to his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, he was, uh, verse 5, He was seen by Peter and then by the 12, and after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some may have died at that time. 
Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. It's a movie you can watch now. You can look it up. But in his book, it was, his book was, he was an investigative journalist who went to prove that Christ didn't live and ended up proving that Christ did live. Christ rose again from the dead and he got saved and is now a pastor of his own church and writes books, etc. See, the fact and the truth was so convincing that when Peter preached about the resurrection of Jesus in the book of Acts, 5,000 were saved and he was arrested. Why arrest someone for telling a harmless lie unless it was worrying truth to the authorities? Historians of all faith, using the method called the inference to the best explanation, can't conclude anything else based on all facts and data available that Jesus resurrected. The inference, that, that theory that they use or that method or technique used points, everything points that Jesus rose again. He rose again in human form and interesting, never to die again. Rose again, never to die again. Over the years, there have been stories and accounts of people being risen again. Risen again. We read of them, in, uh, for example, Lazarus in the Bible, but even in modern times, we may know of and we read of them and you may have experienced it. But they all rose again, but they eventually had to die again. But Jesus didn't. Jesus comes back to a different level of life when he rose again. And so it's not resuscitation that happened to him. He ascends to heaven in front of witnesses never to die again. A whole new level of life was, came out of that resurrection that brings a whole new realm of possibility to humanity. It was not a resuscitation. It was not a mortal man just being resurrected to die again. It was a whole, it was God coming and ascending to heaven and then sending his Holy Spirit. It's a whole new realm of possibility for humanity. And that's what the, why the apostles, and that's what they preached in Jerusalem. And that's what brought thousands to God, the resurrected Christ. Boulders requiring 12 men to move were shifted supernaturally. And Jesus walked out of that tomb alive, whole and victorious. Whole and victorious. The tomb isn't empty because Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, there's three things I want to highlight that we can take from that today. If he's alive, that means we can believe. We, maybe we're doing the, you know, today you might be doing the Easter thing. You know, once a year you go to Christmas, once a year you go to Easter. But you know what? You, and that might be what you're doing today, doing the right thing, come to church at Easter. And you've treated Easter as a myth. And it gives you a great holiday. But I want you to know today, because the proof is there, and because he's still living, and because people are still encountering, he is alive. Maybe even as a church goes, sometimes we can actually just believe part of the Bible. But God is alive. Jesus is alive. And, we have, and, and so we need to believe, and we can believe because the truth is there. And we can believe that there are no other gods. All other religious leaders and cult heads have all died except for Jesus. Only Jesus rose again to never die again. They all have statues and shrines to a dead person. We don't. See, so another fact, the apostles didn't do it is that in their city, it was filled with shrines. And if you were believing in someone that had died, then you were, and, and he hadn't risen again, guess what? It was automatic to put a shrine out. It was the practice to have a shrine to the dead deity or the dead leader or the dead person. It was part of Jerusalem. It was part of the culture of that time. There was no shrine. There was never a shrine. And there was never a statue. We don't worship statues. Why? Because he's alive. Why would you worship somebody's statue when he's alive to encounter? Christians don't have shrines. We don't do it. Why would we do it? Because one, God is alive, and if it's your family, remember, guess what? They're in eternity. See, we can believe also that God loves us. Romans 5 says this, when, verse 6, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came out, came at just, I love this, at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, no one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God loved that much. God the Father and Christ the Son proved their love for us. We can believe, therefore, in his power to forgive, save and set free and heal. Someone who claims to be God, lives holy, performs supernaturally, dies humbly, loves sacrificially, 
resurrected powerfully, ascends publicly, and then sends His Holy Spirit to His church can only be the one and true God. Let me just repeat that. Someone who claims to be God, then lives holy, performs supernaturally, dies humbly, loves sacrificially, resurrected powerfully, ascends publicly, and sends His Holy Spirit, can only be the one and true God. So He loves us. The second thing we can do is that if if we know that He's alive, is we can trust Him. We can trust Him to keep His Word. His coming death and resurrection throughout the Old Testament was prophesied multiple times and it occurred exactly as it was prophesied. He himself predicted his death and and prophesied his resurrection and as we already read in that account and you can read in other accounts in Matthew 16. And if Jesus kept his word in his resurrection, he can and will keep his word in everything else. Romans 3 says this in verse 3, What if some of you did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Wow. Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Will he stop being faithful because we don't have faith? Not at all. Glad you asked. Let God be true and every man a liar. God is always faithful. Don't forget it. Even the disciples, they forgot the promise that Jesus had made. I'm going to be resurrected. And they didn't embrace the joy of his resurrection. They sat stunned like stunned mothers. Or they grieved or they denied or they went wandering and they disappeared. Or they, they, they had all kinds of reaction except for going, oh, wow, yes, it's true. I mean, it's so human. You know, God has made a promise and then when something happens, get, oh, wow, no. Ah. But God is true. His word, God, what is it? The word said, God, let God be true and every man a liar. Don't forget it. Our problem as believers is we are quick to forget. We don't remember. We believe the secular, we are so embraced in a secular system and human, a humanistic system that we, are, we forget and we're quick to deny as we listen to the deniers. We are to receive our hope not from the deniers but from the word of God. The woman, I love this, the woman believed first. Men, wake up, shake up, start to believe. It's so true. It's so true in our world today. It's so quick to embrace God's truth. So true. The men, in spite of Jesus' claims, he made the promise. The women came back, and guess what? The men go, nah. Don't be a naysayer. Men, I just want for one minute, buck up. Be a yes, 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 a man of faith. Well, gee, I got the women clapping, but no, man. I'll leave it to Jesus to shake you up. And if he shakes you up, man, you're in trouble, all right? Jesus, I love this, continues to be faithful and keeps appearing. I love this. He's so faithful. He can be so trusted. He just keeps appearing. You know, all through the story, they're all saying, nah, it can't happen. They're all having their little fear sessions. They're in the upper room worrying about what's going to happen. And, or they're going wandering off. Peter disappears off fishing and doing other things. Everybody's got two men on the road to Emmaus are talking about the events as if it's all over and done with. And Jesus just keeps turning up. Just keeps turning up. He turns up when P- Peter has quit. He turns up with the 20-kilometer trip to Emmaus as these guys are talking. And he's standing there and these two dummies don't get it. But guess what? They know they're men. That says something. They didn't get it. His presence is there until he breaks breath, bread. Ten disciples in the upper room with sorrow and grief, hiding maybe even fear until he turns up. And yeah, I love it. He just keeps turning up. We might not be faithful, but he is faithful. We may not be, we may be in fear, but he is faithful to over and appear for your fear. And then Thomas refuses to believe, no, nah, I've got to stick my hands in your side and stick my fingers in there until Jesus turns up. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I think I'll keep my hands out of your side and my fingers out of your side. He's so faithful. He's so faithful. He promises never to leave or forsake us. He promises never to bring judgment like Noah's day. Do you know that? He said, I'm not going to do that again. In fact, Jesus is the replacement for that kind of judgment until he comes again, and there we will all be held accountable. He's promised to forgive and to heal. He promises to provide as we obey. He promises the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has come. He promised life. Remember, he said, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I will give life. 
He promised acceptance. He promised persecution, but never to leave us alone. He promised joy. He promised eternal life and reward. He made all these promises and he's ready and waiting if we will receive them by faith. We've got to trust him. And the third thing that if, we, if he's alive, we can know him. We can believe him, we can trust him, and we can know him. Because he's alive, he's real to encounter. He's not a ghost, a mystical. He is real to encounter. In Luke 24, as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. Verse 30, and then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? These are the men that disappointed, talking about the news of the time, followers of Jesus, walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus. By the way, they turned around and went back. And on that journey, Jesus walked with them, talked with them, even told them to you know, open up Scripture to them, and they hadn't got it. He discussed and he prayed to them, looking for when they were getting, waiting for them to get it. And while in the presence of a live Jesus, they said, didn't our hearts burn? Didn't our hearts burn? There's something about the presence of God when you're in His presence. And because He's given us the Holy Spirit, we can live with that burning heart. A heart that burns when we start to meditate on, when we open the Word of God and He speaks. Our hearts burn. Our hearts burn because He's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. He's not a statue. He's not a pile of dust. He's not a shrine in Jerusalem. He's a living, accountable, relatable, connectable, encounterable God who's alive. His name is Jesus. We can know him. And while in that presence, uh, their hearts burn. They had a tangible encounter with a living God because that's what Jesus wants. He kept turning up. He kept wanting to encounter them. He turned up today. We could have all sat and we could have said, there's going to be a terrible morning. We got no, the musicians had to change. And we lost our Sandman a couple of minutes before. It's going to be a disaster. I haven't got anybody. The water's cold. Guess what's cold? It's not my problem. It's yours. And, you know, and we could have all said, I've had enough. Oh, it's it. it just is a disaster. But what did we do? We pressed in. We pushed in. We connected with the living God. And we had an encounter with Jesus this morning. We're preaching the word and Jesus is in the room. And your hearts are burning. He is our life. His promises are real. He can be trusted. He can be believed in. He can be followed. He just keeps turning up. He turned up the 10 disciples. He turned up for Thomas. He turned up for Peter. He just keeps turning up. God's love and faithfulness means he keeps revealing himself because he wants to encounter you and lead you to a relationship. John 15 says this, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said, you are my friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. There needs to be a mind shift, I think, on resurrection someday. That I'm actually a friend of the living God, an alive God. If I think he's Casper, the friendly ghost, I'm a friend of a ghost. I'm a friend of something white that's missed around. I can't relate. I can't, I can't connect. But no, he's a person, he is God, who calls us friends. In Galatians 4, he moves to another level and says this, but when the time had fallen come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, verse uh, 5, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, you are daughters. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And the spirit calls out, Abba, Father. From within us, we call out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, a daughter. And since you are a child, God has made you also an heir. And guess what? If we don't have that revelation that we are a child of God, then how do we get a revelation that there is an inheritance for us? How do we have that? How can we believe that there's something waiting for us, even now and in eternity, that God wants to use us, walk through us, talk to us, relate to us, be in us and provide for us, be closer than a brother? How do we, how do we know that if we don't believe that we're an heir? 
If we're still believing that I couldn't, a uh, uh, son, I should say, if we're still believing that, I, that God couldn't cover all my sins, that he really couldn't adopt me, who would adopt me into this family? Oh, can't you see what I'm really like, God? And God says, yeah, no, I don't see what you're really like. All I see is that Jesus has washed away all your sin. And so come in, son. Come in, daughter. And come into my family. Let me embrace you. Let me show you. Let me be part of your life. Let you follow me so that you can receive all my inheritance now and in eternity. If we don't grasp this relationship thing, he will always be out there and there will be no relationship and there will be no inheritance. He said, I've called you friends and I call you my son. And Jesus showed this by revealing himself to Peter. In John 21, if you continue to read the story after what, uh, uh, other accounts of uh, what happened on resurrection, you see he eventually in John 21 has an experience with Peter. Peter, it appears, if we read what happened to Peter, if you know the story, Peter, on, uh, on Good Friday, what we'd call Good Friday, he denies. He denies Jesus. Uh, for the young girl says during the trial, um, and uh, he deni- she says, oh, aren't you a follower of Jesus? And he goes, no, I'm not. Three times he denies that he's a follower of Jesus. The Bible describes he ran from the scene. The shame and the guilt. And then he remembered that Jesus had said, you're going to do this, pal. And as he ran, and, and then the resurrection Sunday comes, or Easter Sunday, this day comes, and he runs to the grave. But you notice when we read the account, he looks in. Something holds him back. Maybe it's the shame, maybe it's the guilt, I don't know, but something I want, but I I don't think he wants me. I want, but does he really want me? I let him down. Does he really want me? And he walks away going, and his grief and his fear, and maybe his shame and his guilt stops him remembering that Jesus said, I'm rising again. And so he doesn't recognize that there is a risen Savior wandering somewhere. That Jesus is out of there. There's nothing there. The two, these boulders have gone and there's nobody there. So in his fear and grief, he forgets. He doesn't, he forgets that Jesus had promised to rise again. That happens to us. In our fears and our failures, we forget the promises that God has made that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm waiting for you. I'm faithful to you, even if you deny me. I'm waiting for you. The prodigal son describes their father who just waited and waited for his son to come to his senses and come back to receive his inheritance. And so we have Peter like a prodigal son. Is he really there? I don't know. And, and this journey of uncertainty seems to continue on for a few days after that because we don't see much of him. Apart from that moment, we don't hear anything. And then one day... As Jesus is appearing to everybody else and they're having encounters with the risen Jesus, he's gone, I'm just off fishing, man. And he goes back to the past rather than embracing the risen Savior. And we're so like us. So we can get so consumed by what's gone wrong and what's not right and all the failures or whatever is come, that we will, instead of looking to the risen Christ who has proven himself, who will actually go, you know what? I'm going back to being comfortable, you know, Jesus said it was going to be tough, and you know what? It is tough. I'm just going to go back and be a fisherman. And if you're honest with many of you, I've done it in ministry. In fact, when I went into full-time ministry, God spoke to me, and I had a bonfire of all my filing cabinets of documents that I'd used in contracting life, and I had a bonfire and burnt them all because I think he knew that I'd be someone that would go, I'm going back. And so I burned them all, and I couldn't go back. And I remember a few years ago, uh, 10 or so years ago, having gone for a really tough time in our lives and uh, just felt, felt, uh, we felt very alone. And I made this phone call and I rang somebody, uh, uh, one of these agents uh, that uh, get your jobs and that. And I said, oh, I've been out of the business for about 10 or 15 years, whatever it was at that time. Any chance of coming back? He goes, nah. <laughs> I said, thank you, Jesus. I got that. <clears throat> Hung up, never looked back again. But it's what you do. Instead of remembering all that he has already provided, remembering the promise that he gave, I still remember the promise he gave when we entered into full-time ministry, never remembering the miracles that he's provided for you and the moments that he stepped in and, and, and the word of God that's sitting in your heart, those burning moments, those, those presence moments, those promise moments, and we look back. And that's what Peter did. 
I'm just going to go back where it's comfortable, where I know it's familiar. I don't have to step out of faith in fishing. <laughs> the fish are always going to be there. Some days it might not be so good as other days, but there's a whole ocean full. There's a whole sea of them. I'm just going to go back and be comfortable. I'm just going to go back and stop this journey. But you know what? Jesus says, that's not what I planned for you, Pete. I have a plan. I have a destination. That's not what I planned for you, Peter. And so guess what? While Peter's fishing, Jesus turns up. He turns up for breakfast, by the way. The most intimate meal in the day. Because when you have breakfast, for most of us, you don't look really good when you wake up in the morning. Some of us look perfect. When you don't have any hair, you actually don't have hair that sticks out. So you're going to always look great. You don't have any grey hair to show, so you're always going to look young. Yeah. I'm really 110. So. <clears throat> but, you know, that's the morning where people are at their tiredest or at their weakest, their most vulnerable. Now, not necessarily for Peter, but for us, there's an imagery there. That he turns up on the beach and starts preparing a fire, and then Peter gets, John says, that's Jesus. And suddenly, Peter goes, that's my Saviour. He still hasn't given up on me. He hasn't given, he's come Jesus has come and he hasn't given up on me. He's sitting on the beach waiting for me and he rushes into the water. He comes to the beach and he has a meal with Jesus. And you know how, why that happened? Because Jesus is alive. And he's in this place today calling people, people that have disappointed themselves and feel like they're disappointed God, people who aren't walking with him, people who have never known him, people who have walked away from him, people who been coming to church for years but have stepped back and just said you know what it's too hard I failed in that time we could have the keyboard at this moment these are the moments where we can remember that Jesus is always faithful see the problem was not the facts the facts are there the problem was the church the disciples didn't have the faith to believe in the facts their fears got in the way of their faith. Their failures got in the way of their faith. And this morning, Jesus rose again that you may be forgiven of your fears, restored from your failures, so you can actually have faith in Him again. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, In a few minutes, we're going to baptize three young people. Each of those young people, in their way, they had to ha have their own encounter with Jesus. They had to make a decision that they would follow Jesus. It might have been a moment like we're having right now. It may have been another time at home. But there was a moment where they just chose to follow Jesus. And this morning, this is your moment. For those who have never made that decision, the facts are there. Historians know. It all points to the fact, will you step out in faith and believe in Him today? For anybody that has really felt strongly, as I've even been, as I've preached, I've moved into a sense of failure, a sense of fear, and God couldn't want me. Oh, God wants you. That's why He gave it to Jesus. And Jesus paid the ultimate price. And we talked about this on Friday. And then He proved His power over the worst sin, the worst that Satan could do. He proved His power over it. He allowed Himself to die to prove that He was more powerful than anything the universe can do or throw. And this morning, He's more powerful than your fear. He's more powerful than your failure. He's more powerful than your sin. He's more powerful than any argument you can throw against Him because He's alive. So in this place today, will you choose to let those fears and failures go and have faith in Him to follow Him this morning. Trust Him. Believe in Him. Follow Him. If that's you this morning. If you're one of those I've been talking about, you just raise your hand up. We're not going to bring you to the front. We just want to know who you are so we can pray with you. 
and then we'll look out for you afterwards if you want to. But any of us this morning know that God is drawing you, the Holy Spirit is just saying, hey, I need you. I want you to come and know me. If that's you this morning, just lift your hand and we're going to pray. Anybody in this place that needs to follow, knows they need to get right with God and come back. See, Peter, to have breakfast with Jesus, still had to get out of the boat and come to the shore. Jesus is willing and waiting. As one old chorus goes, he's willing and waiting. Is that? But are you ready to believe and come to him this morning? This morning in this place today, anybody right now, the sense of failure, don't let it stop you and send you backwards. Receive him so you can keep moving forward. Father, this morning over this place, I sense your Holy Spirit here. I sense you're working on particular areas in people's lives that because you're alive, Jesus, we can believe, we can trust, we can have faith and follow you. And I pray this morning as we continue into the water baptism that you'll continue to minister to people right now. Continue to minister to people where they're at so that they can move from where they're at to where you want them to be. In Jesus' name I ask it. The cross is empty. The great, it was the greatest deed ever in history. The greatest love, the act of love, the greatest showing of humility and obedience, the greatest miracle ever. We thank you for that, that we are part of that today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, let's give the Lord a... Just, just thank you, Lord, that you are alive. Jesus, you are alive in this place today.